everybody, Resident Loser Jeremy here. Just wanted to pop on and do a live. I feel like I haven't done one in a long time. So let me know real quick if you guys can hear me, if you can see me, if you can hear Pro Tools. Here's Pro Tools real quick. So if you can hear anything, studio tour, let's go. I know, man, I'm getting on it. I got it. <laughs> I'm in between the sessions right now and I'm I'm actually in a place where I want to I'm redoing a lot of the studio and I've been planning that out so I was like do I do one before I do all the redo or do I wait and do one after or is that something people just want to see all parts of I don't know we'll see I let me know what you think if you want to see one before I do the redos I want or if I should just wait Hey, sounds good. Looks good. Sweet. I think I might be getting the hang of this thing. We can hear you. Great timing. Hey, all right. Sounds good. Hey, if you guys uh, can see this, where you're coming from, let me know how many of you saw the video I just put out. I'm kind of curious how many people see those. And I'm still figuring out the YouTube stuff, algorithm, all that fun stuff. I mean, any insight you guys have is always appreciated. But with this one, I just want to quickly... Just get on here. I've got a session pulled up. It's actually a super old session because, like I've said in past videos, uh, YouTube copyright stuff is a whole lot of fun to navigate. But this one is something that was never released. It was, I have permission from the artist. It's not copyrighted in any way. So I can kind of go through this mix, if I can even call it a mix. This was like partly done. The, the artist never even came back and did vocals on it. So um, there are no vocals on this, but I can kind of give insight as to what was done as far as the tracking and stuff. So I can kind of play around with that. But I feel like any questions you guys have, feel free to ask whatever. It really doesn't matter. Um, doesn't have to be about this. It could be business. It could. I mean, a lot of the questions you guys put on the videos are really interesting and wouldn't really make sense to do like a whole video on. But I feel like this is a cool venue for stuff like that. So. Uh, oh, wow. There's already people talking. Uh, just do it. Yeah, before is fine. You can update the change or nothing. Yeah, I, I guess I can go ahead and make one. I mean, it's, I don't know. It always seems like you're kind of glorifying the gear in that case. And, and that's not what I'm about. But I feel like if you guys watch the channel, you kind of know that about me. But that said, we could, we, I could probably do one. I should do one. I should. I'll just do it. Okay. It's done. Hold me to it. If you don't see one, just keep bugging me about it. Show the patch base setup. I can do that. Wonder if I could make that work today, actually. The way the camera's set up. I could probably make that happen today. Um, don't get pushed to my sub box. Didn't get pushed to your sub box. Do you have notifications turned on? And there's actually like different versions of those notifications even when you do press it because if you sub even the channels that i really love like i love watching uh some different financial channels as well as like uh the builders channel like woodworking and stuff i make sure i always check all on the ones i really really want to see and you guys don't have to do it for mine if you don't want to see all my videos don't do it but if you really do want to see all of mine um, make sure your notifications are set to all, even if you just hit the subscribe button, it'll be like, okay, yeah, we like this kind of video. But if, uh, if you hit the bell, it'll go to like personalized by default. And even that won't show you every video I put out. So just know that if you want to see every one of them, hit the all button. Hey man, have you ever had a lopsided wave? If you have, what's up with that? I have, I don't really know. Um, <laughs> in some cases I've had, there's been like voltage issues. I think I've been told with the mic. I don't really exactly know. So, and there's so many different situations where that can be the case. Like snare drum seems to be the one that you really see it. Like anything that's transient heavy where you would notice that it's lopsided. Do you have a little more information there we might be able to diagnose that but kind of shooting in the dark that's a little that's a little tough so uh gear won't make the difference but it's fun to look at and do it up yeah that's that's true i'll i'll admit that fact 
Well, I haven't listened to this in a while, and I am curious. Let me switch this over to the Pro Tools window. Boo! There you go. I'm forcing myself to like night mode, and we'll see if I can actually get into that. But I'm curious as to what this sounds like. I can hear him talking in the beginning. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> this guy was a lot of fun. It doesn't sound too bad. actually sounds pretty cool <laughs> so this is not a mix as i'm listening to it and kind of remembering where this was this is kind of just beyond tracking um this had not gotten to an edit this had not gotten to a mix this is basically what we were listening to when we did it uh even looking at what's on here i'm i'm genuinely curious about how old this session is so let me see Twenty eighteen. And I think that's when I transferred it to a different hard drive. So I think it's even I think it's even older than that. I'll have to go back and look at my calendar, but I'm ninety percent sure this is like three or four years old. Just twenty eighteen, I made a switch to all new hard drives, and it would make sense that March in the spring is when I bought new hard drives, and this was not recorded in the spring. So I would I'm gonna venture to say this is three or four years old. But uh yeah any questions about this we can go over that jump in at any time with any other questions you might have because we don't have to stick with this this is just what i got pulled up love to hear out how you balance the mid raginess of this style of guitar and the snare bark and stuff i find it tougher to work on daniel howl yo yo what's up man <laughs> uh about the mid-rangey stuff I don't know. It's all based on feel, and especially in this case. I mean, let's go down to these guitars and see what we did. So I recorded... Use compressor on API. I love comments. If you're not using comments on your tracks, definitely use your comments. For something that's this old, three to four years old, holy cow, use a comment you won't, if you will forget what you do. Even sessions that I do weeks ago, I forget what I'm using, and sometimes it's just helpful to go back, so... Obviously, I did not put a comment on what amp we were using, but if I'm going to guess, we were probably using the PRS Archon for this. Um, or the Mesa Boogie. I honestly don't know. I think for this, we just wanted like all out in your face, pumpy, gross stuff. And so it was, I know I'm using an API, a uh, little pedal on that. Um, actually, let me grab that real fast. I know it's the cardinal sin to walk away from the stream, but this is the API pedal that I'm talking about. And it, this is a big boy. I don't know if you can even really see that. Let me change the camera angle. It's 
So this is the API pedal that I was talking about. Um, this works as a DI because you have an XLR out on the side as well as you have a level and gain. So you can actually push really, really hard into different amps as well as like an onboard EQ that's really useful. But for this type of sound, we knew we just wanted that front end crazy push into a tube amp to really saturate those preamp tubes. Uh, we weren't really going heavy for, if I remember right, and because this is typically my approach with stuff like this, I don't push in the front end super hard to the point where you're almost like fuzzing the amp out. And it has that really interesting character that I really like and it naturally compresses. It has that kind of gross feel to it. Um, but how balancing it with the snare, let's see. So there's a lot going on here. This is when I was super into Glen Johns. <laughs> uh, so I would set up all different kinds of miking schemes, not really knowing what I was doing. And now that I'm thinking about it, this was in the middle of like one of the busiest months I ever had. It was everybody was having a week long stay at the studio. So there was this guy, there was a band before him, there was a band after him, and they were all different kinds of stuff. So I had all these different mics set up. Sure, it wasn't a Line 6 Spider. Yeah, it wasn't a Spider, I guarantee. <laughs> um, but I would always set up all these different mics. I have my normal overheads. I have Glenn Johns, and those just sound totally different. Like, here's the overhead. And then the Glenn Johns. And those overheads, that's an R88 and the Glenn Johns, they're like small diaphragm condensers, Sheps and K21s. Um, and they're, if you've never done Glenn Johns, like try it out. I'm not sure I'm doing like exactly, I think I'm doing like an adapted Glenn Johns, if I'm being honest. I typically put one about a foot over the head of the drummer in front of the kit pointing down at the snare and then coming back from the floor tom pointing at the snare pretty low about the level of the floor tom so you kind of have these two mics lasering in at the snare drum and if you measure those two distances you make sure your snare is in phase so from the center of the snare measure out to this one from center of the snare measure out to that one and then you know you're in phase um and i kind of complement that with the overhead and when you mix match those like if i bring this all the way down then Like they're completely different sounds, but they complement each other in a really cool way. Like that overhead is the natural picture of the kit or the Glenn Johns, at least how I'm using it in this, where typically Glenn Johns would be like a natural way of capturing a kit. I'm using it for like a modern width and sheen because those mics are so bright. Um, so they kind of had that modern flavor as opposed to the ribbon mic that I was using as an overhead. Holy questions. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, what's your take on recording in a home studio than sending it to a mix engineer? I think I saw you ask this question on another video, man. Um, and I had already filmed a video where I kind of answer your question, but I'll go ahead and answer real quick. Um, but stay tuned for that video because I do talk about this a little more. Um I th I think there's nothing wrong with it. Like a lot of the stuff that I am mixing not all of it, but a good portion of it is recorded in home studios. And it's a really good way for your artists to save money. And if you're, if you have it, like, are you approaching this? I think in your other question, I took the, took from this, that you are approaching this from the artist standpoint, like recording in a home studio as the artist and then sending it to a mix engineer. Correct me if I'm wrong on how I'm interpreting that, but I think there's there's nothing wrong with that, especially if you if you have a mix engineer you have a good relationship with. Keeping open communication through that is huge, and especially if you're the artist, um, as opposed to like a typical studio with all these different flavors and all these different mic pre's and all these different mics. Like if you're an artist and you know what sound you're going for, 
and you spend your time honing that sound, you don't need all this variety. You can have what works for you and for your sound, and you can be hyper-focused in that moment. There's nothing wrong with that. You're not recording other people. It's your stuff, so you don't have to have all these options that a typical studio would have, so that keeps your overhead way down. On the contrary to that, typically the difference between like studio and home studio stuff is like the room treatment and how good the room actually sounds, but... If you spend a little bit of money, even just getting a little bit of sound treatment, like it can go a long, long way in helping uh, anything you could have. It's even cheap studios that you would go to, like cheap to mid-level studios. They're not that different than like a residential space if they're not in a residential space already. So if you think about it that way, the building materials within that space are going to be little to no different than what you would have in your own home studio. Now, you start to get into the upper echelon, that's where it can really change. But if you experiment within your own space and you have that kind of control and you're not spending more money on another studio and you can really hone in what that room sounds like and use its weaknesses and quirks to your benefit, then there's absolutely no, no loss there. Said, so, yeah, I just asked that in another video. That's why I said great timing for the live. Huh, there you go, man. I hope that was kind of what you were talking about. Um, dark mode and Pro Tools doesn't work for me. They changed the color palette too much, especially in dark mode. Yeah, it's it's hard to it's hard to know. Oh, where's my? It's hard to know. Let me transition back to Pro Tools here. It's really hard to see what's selected. Like, especially when your groups are on, boom. It's obvious now, but <laughs> like in a very in a really, really large session, and this one's not that big, but especially if you're zoomed in, like it's hard to know. Is that selected? Is it not selected? I don't know. It's, it's I kind of like I like some of it. I'm just doing it for variety, I guess. I'll probably switch it off here later. Um man, a lot of questions. Daniel Howell about to report that as offensive comment on <laughs> the line six fighter. You're right in the line, man. Uh, knowing the size of a seven B that pedal's big. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. This thing's huge. If you guys, this is an iPhone, iPhone 11, not the newest one, but yeah, check. It's a, it's a big, it's a big boy. It's a big old boy for sure. And it's it weighs a lot too. This is not meant for a pedal board. <laughs> I like what they were going for, and I had it on my live pedal board for a while, and it sounds fantastic. But just alone, this thing weighs like eight pounds. It's, I mean, I could, don't have to go to the gym, save some money. Uh, sounds like, whew, holy cow, the questions are just coming in. I love it, guys. I'm sorry if I can't keep up if I miss them. Hey, from Greece. What's up, dude? Uh, when purchasing gear, have you ever used Zounds? I've been considering their payment plan to purchase an SM7B. I think I did a long time ago. For uh, If I'm typically purchasing something, it's coming from uh, Sweetwater most of the time, just because I'm so close. Um, however, I don't know. There's a salesman in this group right now, and I don't know if he wants me to call him out because I'm not sure if I would be, if I would... Uh, be doing him a disservice or not i'll let himself i'll let him reveal himself if he likes but there's another company that's uh pretty dope <laughs> so but yeah typically if i'm buying stuff like that sweetwater vintage king those are the two mainstays for me um that said i mean it's all the same gear go with well with what's right for you if you have a payment plan and you know you're going to make the money back go for it um sounds like two mics one on the top one on the bottom of the snare yep uh, so that was a uh, Grinelli 57 and that just means it has the bend in it. Like I added the bend to it and I took the transformer out of it. I take the transformers out of most of my 57s. As a SM81 on the bottom and I really like that. I haven't used an SM81 for a long, long time, but I think I'm going to do it again. That's pretty dope. And I'm crushing it. This is this is pretty typical for me. 
especially with this sound like i'm using almost the bottom snare mic as a room mic if that makes sense if you have a good snare sound and we wanted a trashy ringy gross thing but if you have a snare sound you know you're gonna like in the end and you're not gonna have to lean on a sample i love to just obliterate that bottom head as long as it's not too sharp sounding and almost use it to pick up that gross stuff from the whole kit. Like you can hear it react to everything. And then when I pull it away, you can really hear that attack and sharpness of those snares, like sympathetically vibrating with everything else on the kit kind of goes away and the kit loses attitude for sure. Uh, hey, hey, home studio has a whole new meaning now. Home studio doesn't mean amateur anymore. I absolutely agree with that. The home studio nerd, your name is very appropriate for that question that you answered someone else asking. I totally agree with that. Uh, I think I had, I do have a commercial location. I am in a commercial studio, but ultimately like this is like to, in my mind of my overarching goals for my entire career, like this is good for me right now. I get, I get business. This is, this is how I build my career. I build my network with people. Ultimately, I don't want to have to have a location. I would love to have one room at home that can then sustain me. But I feel like this for me in my career, this is right for me right now. Um, but a home studio is definitely in my future. And that's where I would like to quote unquote retire my music career probably is back at home. Uh, Cause that just sounds like the life to me where I can be close to my family, close to my kids yeah, home studio is not a gross word anymore, and I don't think it, it... It definitely shouldn't hold that same negative connotation that it used to. Uh, hey, good people from snowy Sweden. Oh, dude. It's people watching from so far away. This is so cool. <laughs> I live off the grid in a tent. Been mixing on headphones, about to get an apartment, and I'm going to treat my room. Good to know what treatment isn't too expensive. Um, I use and check check out a lot of stuff because depending where you're where you're located, like geographically, these materials are very very different in price. I use uh, Ruxol, that's R U X O L, uh, safe and sound because for me where I'm at, it's it's pretty cheap. There's a, there's rock. I think rock wool is what it's called now because I, I think they changed their name from Ruxol to rock wool. I could be wrong. Look it up. Safe and sound, three inch batting. Um, you can get twenty four inches on center or sixteen inches on center. Sorry, I I am not smart enough to change that to metric. Although I appreciate metric a little more. It's a inches make no sense. But um, but check that out. There's a whole lot of different uh, options. Like you can get. I think it's called seven hundred one. Uh, I'm gonna be embarrassed here. I don't really know seven hundred one or three hundred one. Like rigid fiberglass where the Ruxel is more pliable and bendable and it can kind of fall apart a little bit. The other stuff, the 701, I believe, is a very rigid um, a rigid bat and you can do a little more with it as far as hang it directly on a wall. But if, you, if you're if you even the least bit handy uh, and you've been off grid, it sounds like, so you probably have some talent there, uh, you could just get some cheap lumber wherever you can find it build a very little frame and then suspend whatever batting you decide to get inside of that and then hang out on the wall uh, it's not going to be perfect but whatever studio you have could be vastly improved just by doing those little things uh, and then something like sonar works can help too but i will say if you if you've been on headphones for a while and you're used to headphones stay on headphones as long as possible like People can mix professional records on headphones. There's no reason you can't. So don't feel like you have to get into the world of monitoring and all this stuff. But if you're used to headphones, I'm not. <laughs> but if you are, stay there, man. You could be so mobile. And there's no reason you can't make great records that way. Uh, that's it. If you want to make the transition, some things are a little bit easier on monitors. But um, I feel like it's much easier if you're already in the headphone world. I had this conversation with another engineer. And he was talking about making that switch too. Uh, 
he was nervous about going to headphones, but I was like, man, if you can figure that out and you can make that workflow work for you on headphones, you're way more flexible down the road. And it's just like monitoring like anything else. I don't think there is a best studio monitor. It's a silly question, but as long as you're used to your listening environment and you know how it translates, that's what matters. So sometimes changing something just to change it is more detrimental. Uh, any on, suggestions on building a portfolio while in quarantine? Before everything shut down in my area, I had three sessions booked to build a portfolio, but they fell apart. That's a pretty typical, yeah, that definitely, I mean, my, my schedule was slammed. Uh, and <laughs> going into that definitely changed a whole lot. <laughs> and uh, there was definitely some panic for sure. Um, it, I, that's a hard, it's a hard one. It, it changed. And I think what helped me was just staying in contact with as many people as possible because everybody was at home. Right. Um, and just having open conversations, not even necessarily like, Hey, do you have anything I can mix? It's just being genuinely concerned with how people are doing. Um, and then come to find out a handful of those people are still creating music at home. I don't know why I'm still on the Pro Tools window. Let's go back to this one. We're just chatting now. But a handful of those people were still making music at home. Uh, and I got I'd get, I got a lot of questions as far as like, how can I build out something to be able to record at home? Um, so I helped some of those people set up little systems at home so they could make banging demos or like songwriter demos to be really, really prepared for when they came to the studio, which really paid off. Um, or they were just creating music at home and that's kind of become their outlet. And it seems like that would be a detriment to what we do because you're telling someone how to not come to your studio. But on one hand, it was giving these people the creative control to do what they want to do at home. And especially for like a really focused artist who knows what they want, that can be a really good thing because they're just pumping out material now. And it's given me a lot more to mix in that instance. So it's, it's, it is hard. Um, I don't think there's one good answer there other than just be in contact with as many people as you possibly can. And like, if I, if I pound anything into my videos, it's like genuine concern for others, like with any industry, does it music or not? Um, people can figure out if you're a good dude or not, or good dude at. So, Oh, where am I at? Okay. Sorry to try to catch up on these questions. Thoughts on Behringer as a company ethics. I don't know. Uh, I have seen this kind of blow up recently. I haven't really followed what's happening very much. Um, I will say I do have some Behringer gear. All of my hearback systems are the Behringer power play systems, which I like those. I bought those 10 years ago. Nine, nine, nine or 10 years ago. Um, I don't think I've purchased anything else Behringer since then, but I don't know. Uh, I like, I do like their cheap gear, but again, I'm not familiar with really what's going on outside of that. That's as far as I'll go. That seems like a hot button issue. How's that M1 life? Dude, that computer is fantastic, and I know I teased a video. I'm going to do it. I swear I'm going to do it. But <laughs> I'm, I want to wait until more of those plugins that I'm using are compatible with it because I think it would be silly to do my studio machine on the Mac Pro and then try to replicate that on the M1 when not everything is totally compatible yet. And it's not the computer's fault, honestly. Um, I want, I know I can downgrade that OS. I know I can go through Rosetta to do a whole lot of stuff, but I want, and there's a, there's a lot of videos of people already doing that and they're really cool. And even in doing that, the computer is surprising. Uh, but I wanted to wait until it's as compatible as possible um, maybe going through Rosetta, maybe not to get a one-to-one -one and really do a test at that point. And even then I think it's going to be surprising. 
Uh, but I have been using it for video editing and it's been crazy. Like no computer that cheap should be able to do what it does. It's, it's pretty surprising. Uh, sweet water for the win. <laughs> uh, hey from snowy Spain. Everybody's got snow, but us. So we typically have, I'm in Indiana, crazy hot summer. Normally have a lot of snow by now, but we don't. Um, watched a clip on YouTube where they reviewed different treatments. A stack of towels one. I saw that video as well. I think that was, uh, oh, what is his channel? Oh my gosh. Uh, he is the same. He makes a lot of tag him. If you remember who that is, this is channel is fantastic, but yeah, he tested a lot of different sound application stuff and like literally making a bat of used towels. Like, I mean, clean, clean towels, use clean towels, but it outperformed a lot of the stuff that's meant for sound treatment. So if you want to go to like Goodwill or Salvation Army or somewhere, you can just get a bunch of towels. It's a pretty good option. <laughs> Uh, Ruxel safe and sound three inch frame frame it yourself so much cheaper yeah exactly don't get the egg crate stuff Uh, it looks cool that's about as far as it goes the egg crate stuff does little to nothing Um, Ruxel if you can do it too deep and get it six inches off the wall you can really tame your low frequencies that way um, if you can, when you're hanging that bat, don't do it right against the wall. Try to separate it from the wall a little bit. You can do standoffs, um, getting a cloud above your head, basically hanging one from the ceiling will help you a ton. Yeah. If, if Ruxel is what you have available, there's nothing wrong with that or use towels. There you go. Uh, as a former life sound engineer, best advice is get to know your room. You can mix without acoustic treatment. You definitely can. Um, there's certain things that I think you'll be up against in that. And even without treating your room, like you can get into the instances of like slightly moving left to right and your your image will change. So I'm, I mean, with as cheap as you can treat your room, at least in the in the most minimal of ways, if you're handy even in the least, do it a little bit. Um it helps me a ton. Can you do it without it? Absolutely. I think there's a point of diminishing return. Don't spend thousands of dollars doing it if your mixes aren't bringing in that kind of revenue. Um, but yeah, get to know your room, get to know the tools, get to know your monitors. Like don't go just spend $7,000 on monitors because you can and think automatically your mixes are going to be good because you're going to be pretty upset with yourself if you do that because that is not the case. Trust me. Uh, I'm sure it'd be very complicated to do. It'd be really cool to see a live pre-recorded tracking session to show mic technique and such. I, I've really wanted to do that. And I've actually, I've talked to a few people about trying to set something like that up, but you would have to talk. It'd have to be something out of my own pocket because there are so many like copyright issues that could go right along with that. Um, whose material would it be? It, it could it it would be rough. Um, but I have been talking to people about that, and I think I may have found a way around it with kind of a, without getting into the weeds. But I'm trying to set one of those up, and because I think a, a session from start to finish would be really really helpful, because a lot of this stuff happens before it hits Pro Tools. Um. How are your how are you cleaning your vocal mics during these crazy times? Are you checking temperatures prior to coming into your studio? Yeah, uh I have I mean around here it's kind of rough. <laughs> uh not many people want to follow the rules. Um I do make people wear masks in the studio. Um I have I send out the thing that all of our local community wants us to do as far as like, if you're showing these symptoms, don't do blah, blah, blah. Don't come in here. Um, cleaning the mics. I'm doing the best I can with, um, what is it? The alcohol solution. Um, past that 
keeping sessions a couple days apart because I guess at 48 hours, like you're pretty safe after 48 hours of just something. But I, I only know what I, the information that's been given to me on a local level. So trying my best. It is hard. I did get it from a session and that was not a fun experience, but I don't want to go into that. So yeah, just wear a mask. <laughs> um, Only piece of gear I own. Pro oh, head okay. We're talking about Behringer again. Uh, got everything going through Rosetta and it's a monster exporting 16 drum tracks to send a client's average 10 to 15 seconds. Yeah. Those little things where it's crazy useful. I have done editing on it and it's fast. It, it doesn't feel like you're working on a little tiny laptop, especially the fact that it doesn't get hot. And not hearing those fans ramp up. And I have the Mac Pro. I know the Mac Air doesn't even have a fan, but having that Mac Pro, it's shocking just the amount. Like, I feel like I could cook an egg on my old one, <laughs> but this, it barely gets hot. Would you working, would you recommend working for free to build up a portfolio? I did for a while. Um, if you can afford it, yes, absolutely work for free. Don't do that your whole career. And I, Definitely don't think you should make a habit out of undercutting people. So if work for free or work for very, very little to build up your portfolio quickly and then shift as soon as you can to charging because you don't want to get a reputation as the free person recording. Um, you'll get people walking all over you if that's the case. And you definitely don't want to get a reputation for others around you as the undercutting guy because You'll be surprised how much cooperation you get from other engineers and and how lucrative those relationships can be from people that you think are your competition. Um, it's It can be pretty shocking. So yeah, yes, to start a career, maybe work for free for a few projects. Um, don't just get the easiest band right off the bat. Maybe go big. Go for something you don't think you can achieve because really the band's lost nothing. Go big on those do as much as you can to make it sound as good as you can and then flip that switch to paid gigs as soon as possible. Where are we at here? Uh, dude, the snow's coming today or tomorrow, at least in Illinois. You're in Illinois. Where are you at in Illinois, man? Home studio nerd. I got to watch your channel once I get off here. Can't remember if it was a drummer or the film audio guy who did the towel thing. Maybe neither. I want to say it was uh, DIY Perks. Um, DIY Perks. Yeah. I know he did one on this. I don't know if you guys will be able to see this or not. Do you know? No. DIY Perks. If you don't watch that channel, it's a fantastic channel. I'm pretty sure he was the towel guy. If not, he has a lot of interesting audio videos. Anyway, go check it out. But if you're into anything DIY, one, his voice is just so soothing. It's ridiculous. I can listen to this guy all the time. And two, his projects are insane. Like this dude, dude's, a, uh, I think he's a legitimate genius. Um, but go check out that channel. If that's not even the one with the towel, either way, you're welcome. That's a great channel. Uh, I know that nobody needs outboard gear to make their recordings good, but do you feel that studios equipped with good hardware get taken more seriously by people looking for production work? No, I don't think so. Um, I think there's, well, maybe that's twofold. I don't think the client gives two craps what's in the gear. Um, I did think that way for a while. I don't think it matters at all. Like nobody's going to book my studio because I have a Neve master bus. Nobody cares. That's why a lot of you guys haven't seen it in a video. No, nobody's going to book my studio because I have an inward connections TSL 4V, possibly the greatest compressor ever created. Oh man, nobody cares. Um, even my converters, like I, I think other producers and engineers rent the studio because of my converters. 
a client certainly won't. Um, it is something you can kind of combat buyer's remorse with a little bit, but I don't think the gear is going to get you gigs. That's the sounds. But if the gear helps you get the sounds, there you go. Uh, it's easy to fall into like gear versus software type of discussions, but even then like do what works for you and you can't resell a plugin. So if you're looking at it from a financial standpoint, buying used gear and then reselling that gear, I effectively paid nothing for that gear as opposed to spending thousands on plugins that you may or may not be able to sell for pennies on the dollar. So it's kind of a financial decision. Uh, even though it seems like very grandiose and reckless to buy a ton of gear, it can, if you have the stuff, you can kind of use it and then sell it. So, uh, Hey man, thanks for the live. What piece of advice would you give to a new mastering engineer? Oh man, a new mastering engineer. Oh, I don't know. I don't know that I have the qualifications to advise a new mastering engineer. I do mastering work, uh, but I wouldn't consider myself like a mastering engineer. I typically give clients the option for me to master it, or if they really have a budget, I'll send it to like a real mastering house. And getting somebody on something like that is, whew, those guys know how to do it. Um, I don't know, man. I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> uh, mind your ears, take breaks. Yep. In the process of building a home studio. Woo. Dude, that's a lot of fun. Uh, I believe in work for stuff instead of money in the beginning of your career. Like maybe the drummer you're about to record can donate a snare drum or something instead of money. I've done that too. Taken on projects um, where somebody had like a, a really interesting classic guitar that I really wanted. And in that instance, it may as well just be money unless you're really hungry. In which case you need the actual money instead of a guitar. But yeah, I mean, whatever works. Like if, if, if they have gear to trade, um, that's just as good, especially when you're getting started, man. Totally agree about the DIY perks guy. His voice, yes. Fantastic channel. Oh, almost made it. Uh, Will Brooks just outside of Chicago. Oh, dude. Only have one video up now, just starting to make videos a week ago. Got a few planned. Dude, that's dope. I love home studio nerd. Uh... If I may, big wall of gear looks good for clients, but a load of broken hardware on eBay. Buy, buy a load of broken hardware on eBay. Light them up. Here you go. There's something that that would probably work just as well. Like if you don't know how to use your gear, you may as well buy a lot of broken gear. Um, there is, and I've contemplated going back to this. There's the super old. Uh, digi design consoles like the C24s or the Control 24 that lost their allure a long time ago. And essentially, they're just large mouses. Like, there's nothing you can't do with a mouse and keyboard that you can do on these control surfaces. Um, and they were so expensive back in the day, but now you can get them for a song. Like, they're so cheap, but they look really impressive. And there is something to say about those clients who are definitely talented, but they'll pick the studio that has a console because they think that makes it more serious. So I have contemplated getting one of those just to look like I have a console because they're so cheap. <laughs> so I've definitely thought, thought about that. It's the best way to learn to mix on your own. To learn to mix on your own. Do you mean learning to mix your own songs or learning to mix without like an internship I'm not really sure i understand the question hey i made it to the bottom of the questions how much time we've been on here 45 minutes holy cow guys i have not done anything with this session but y'all are asking good questions I'm going to go back to Pro Tools for a minute. 
Let's just see what's up. I hope you don't mind a link. I'm not sure it will let you put a link in. I'm not sure it'll even let you do that, but you can try. Uh, how do you make people realize they need good mixing? How do you make people realize they need good mixing? That's tough. If a client doesn't even have that as a concern, that's a hard person to convince because they're constantly going to be trying to find a cheaper route. Because I, I, maybe I'm reading your question wrong, but I feel like I've had clients like that before. Um, it's kind of best to cut ties with somebody like that or just do the tracking for them and have them mix it somewhere else. Um, this is, it is really hard when somebody doesn't care about that side of the process whatsoever, and it can really kind of wear on your soul. So uh, convincing somebody, when I have tried to convince someone, it didn't work. I'll just say that. Um, other than that, you can kind of point to, here's what I did with somebody who, here's what I did with a project that I got, and here's what happened after I mixed it. So showing kind of a before and after can kind of open some people's eyes, but even in that instance, it's it's really hard. So uh, great resource for mixing. Yeah, there's there's a lot of interesting like get to know starting tutorials. But other than that, just get in there and start working. Um, learning to mix on your own. Um, I think even that's a hard question to answer. Um, without knowing where you are to begin with, like if you have a, a workflow that you're already kind of into, or if you're literally starting from ground zero, um, yeah, that's tough. If you're starting from ground zero, I would start listening to music, um, find your favorites, find stuff you really, really like, force yourself to listen to music that you're not really familiar with. Force yourself to listen to music that you don't necessarily like, um, put out feelers everywhere and start learning music in general start figuring out and listening to arrangement and what makes catchy songs catchy because a lot of mixing is peeling away layers to make something stand out it's not always in the plugins it's not always in the the way you're eqing something or the way you're compressing something sometimes it's as simple as taking everything else away so that this one thing can have the spotlight so learning it from that standpoint and then using EQ and compression to kind of be the cherries on top of a good or good song and good arrangement, um, maybe the best place to start. Uh, what are we doing here? Thanks for the answer. Great videos. Oh, no problem, dude. Here's a better link, multi-track library resources on their website. Doesn't look visible. Oh, well. Oh, he, so he's trying to leak to something and it's not working. Maybe just tell us what the page is and then maybe people can go to it if they want to. Uh, other thing is, if you want, like, a, find a good mentor, um, have somebody you trust to bounce ideas off of um, or get in contact with somebody you can do kind of, like, mixed lessons with. Uh, I do those. I know other engineers who do those. Um, you can learn a lot from sitting down with somebody and really going through a mix. Um, that can be a really quick way to jumpstart things. Oh, man, the questions keep coming. I love it. This is great, guys. Uh, are you dealing with connecting artists with placements? Just some directions of how to do that. Connecting artists with placements. Do you mean like label placements? What do you mean as far as that? Expound, please. Any tips for somebody trying to start a home studio in the middle of nowhere? I'm getting ready to lean more on mixing since no one has to travel here for it. I live an hour away from my city. Uh, I'll say I live an hour away from a major city in my state. Um, I am kind of in the middle of nowhere. 
Uh, I, if people are coming to record with me, they're typically traveling more than two, three hours. Uh, if not more than that, I have a band coming in a few weeks who's traveling 12, 12 hours flying in. Yeah, that's, I think your work will speak for itself and it's definitely in, in, in a perfect world where people can travel and people can do whatever it's, I don't think geography really matters. Uh, and there's a lot to be said about putting a studio in the middle of nowhere where your overhead's low and property taxes are low and cost of living is low. Um, and even sometimes bands who want to get away from major cities, because when you want to be creative, sometimes people want to get away from distraction and that can be really beneficial. And that's been beneficial for me. Um, sometimes I'll get people from Nashville, Chicago, Detroit, like these larger cities that I'm well over an hour away from. Uh, but because I'm in the middle of the nowhere stuff, stuff moves slower here. I can charge less because I'm not in those locations. Um, so they appreciate that. They get a little more time. There's less distractions. It just kind of seems to work. So people will travel for good work. Uh, so don't feel bad about that. Oh, wow, you really spelled it out. Cambridge-mt.com slash. <laughs> That's well done. Well done, my friend. <laughs> totally agree with that on mixing. The song I'm working on only has two chords. The dubbed verse, just two chords on that riff. Does make it jump out when the downbeat hits. And there's, and there's what? That extra jump jump. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot you can do as far as like peeling layers back. Like I always, with rock stuff, I wonder if this song does it. This will be the real test. So we have a few spots of that in this song. Um, and I don't remember all the songs that were on this record. And I don't even remember how much production I had involved in this because it was so long ago. I think this was, this was a one-man band. This was one guy playing all these instruments. So there was a fair amount of like planning and production that went into these. But it was very much a joint effort between me and that person. Um and he, he was very production minded to start with, but it does seem like me where I'm like, Hey, do a pause here, do this here, do this here. Let's let this part pop out. Let's let this riff just do that. Where it seems so simple, but there's a lot of bands that come in and it's everybody playing the whole time. Lead guitar is playing a lead line the whole time. Drummers playing that same groove the whole time, or they're putting fills everywhere, or the bass player is just doing whatever they want to do the whole time. Everybody's good, but together, nobody's trying to flatter anyone else. And that's, I feel like, with the heart of a good arrangement, everything works together. Um, and if you listen to anything by Max Martin, holy cow, that dude's the king of arrangement. Um, yeah, it's a lot of pop, and it's a lot of... Maybe music you don't like to listen to, but if you want to get a, a kind of a look into what good arrangement is, listen to anything by Max Martin. I it It's amazing what you can learn <laughs> if you put on those ears and not just go like, oh my gosh, I don't like listening to Taylor Swift. I don't like listening to the Trolls soundtrack, but trust me, give it a chance. <laughs> you will learn something. Ah. Uh. Yes, label placements. Getting new group artists into hands of major labels. Um not really. I don't I don't do much of that. I've worked with labels. Um I have some connections there. When I really think something could go, I kind of nonchalantly give that demo over for somebody to listen to, but 
I don't think that's my place. Like I'll like to give as much advice as I can give the artist as many tools as they can to do what they need to do. But if you take away those steps of working hard for something for someone, if you, it, you you want to see that person have that fire to approach it themselves. Um, so I don't know. Yes. And no, I don't know. That's hard. Uh, there's nothing wrong. I will say there's nothing wrong with having a relationship as a recording studio with a whole lot of different record labels, uh, especially independent around who, where you are just being able to provide services to those places can get people connections in ways that happen a lot later down the line, very organically. And that can only help you. That's what I'll say. Um, <laughs> you don't want to, push people on to certain people and kind of mess up those relationships. If that makes sense. It's a, it's a thin line to tread. I'll say that. Just got into the stream. Thank you for the videos here. An owner of a new studio in Spain. I worked for about 18 years in music live and studio. What's your approach? What was your approach when you were new? Um, so you're the owner of a new studio but you have a vast amount of experience in music. What's your approach when you were new? I, I don't know. I think I had, I honestly went into it with not a very good plan. <laughs> and I just, I just recorded a video. I haven't put it out yet. Um, where I kind of talk about it. Like I'm surprised the amount of people that were supporting me in this decision simply because I didn't really think it through like I probably should have. And I was surprised that those people kind of stuck with me and believed in me where I, I talk about the Dunning Kruger effect in one of these other videos that I had already filmed, but I haven't put it out yet where it's almost, you think about the Dunning Kruger effect as like a negative where you just, when you're just starting something and you're, you're a noob in it, you have this super high confidence. Like, you know, everything there is to know about it. And then the more you get to know, the less confident you become until finally you become a master at it. And all of a sudden your confidence comes back. But I think the Dunning Kruger effect in those beginning stages was a big benefit to me. <laughs> I thought I had it figured out, but looking back, I just think how reckless I was and how much of a bad idea. And if I was in that spot, and this is why I find it hard to give advice to other people starting studios, like, like looking back on myself, I would have been like, don't do this. What are you thinking? You're an idiot. But <laughs> there's definitely something like go on that hunger. And I mean, you said you've been in it for 18 years. Like, but even starting that new business and the excitement of all that, like ride that work hard as you possibly can in those first initial stages and have that kind of fire to keep going, use it because it goes away uh, and you have to find it constantly. But there in the beginning, you can definitely use that momentum to keep going. I, ho I hope that that's kind of a different answer. Like it wasn't music related. I hope that helps. <laughs> uh, my studio is located at a damn ranch. If you're not into horses, there's not much to do except recording. Plus, it's really beautiful here. That sounds amazing. That sounds like the ideal studio. Private Beach. Come on, man. What is your studio called? I want to see pictures. That sounds... I'm going to record next to horses. I'm in a business plaza. I have a freestanding building, but everything that's around me is like a dentist, a neurologist, a tax place, like a factory way down the road. It's just other businesses. Real boring. That sounds awesome. Any advice on breaking into recording other genres? Word of mouth has been pretty good to my studio, but because of that reference work, I can offer potential new clients has been limited in that genre. I have that issue definitely um, because you definitely, you, you kind of, whether or not you're trying to specialize into something, you definitely get specialized into something. Um, and there for a while, 
I found myself doing a whole lot of country records and even two years into that, I probably would have said like, I don't like country music, but I was making a whole lot of country records and I found it was something that I was really good at. And, uh, well, I'll say it was something that clients really liked. They liked working with me for those country records because it was something different. I brought a completely different approach, I suppose, than other places they had been before. And I honestly, like my background and what I listen to for fun is a lot of metal um, and a lot of jazz, like Animals as Leaders, um, Gem, uh, obviously Periphery is the big one. But I mean, I listen to all kinds of, like those are what I go to, like Circus Survive, Minus the Bear, um, We Came as Romans, like all these really heavy bands because that was my background. Under Oath was a huge one. Emery. Um, I can go on and on, but all these different records that really, I don't record stuff like that very much. Like I do these videos and sometimes I'll put out stuff that's like that because that's my background. But I thought that's, those are the records I want to make. And I recorded a band that's now pretty big in that field, but honestly it was one of the first records I'd ever done. And they were such a new band well, it wasn't one of the first records I'd ever done. It was one of the first records I ever did in that genre for someone else. And that band was so new and so unpolished that the record's not really something that I'm super happy with looking back, but they went on to be massive in the genre. And I don't want to call them out, but um, that, <laughs> that was a bummer. Like it, that one didn't work out for me. And I do very, very little of that genre recording it tracking it because of that record i do a lot of mixing uh, but i definitely don't put that on my portfolio uh you have word of mouth you almost have to i had one mentor that i don't even want to i don't even want to toss it out there but he said lie <laughs> lie to get the gig <laughs> uh you didn't hear that from me though um but i mean there there is a whole lot of crossover and especially with and things that you wouldn't even really anticipate. If you look for those commonalities in the like sonic aspect of things, like a metal record isn't all that different than a jazz record. As crazy as that sounds, a lot of the sonic approaches that you take in some of those records are very, very much similar. Like there's obviously the razor sharp production of one as opposed to a very natural performance of the other. But other than that, some of the approaches you take are super similar, like way more similar than you would think. Who was it? I want to give that record a listen. I don't even want to put it out there, man. It sounds so bad. <laughs> and that band is really good, honestly. Like they're working with really good people right now. So they're in a perfect spot for them. Uh, yeah, it's it's a band, a metal band named after a book. I'll tell you that much. Um. Tips on growing your social media presence without seeming salesy, needy, without spending too many hours on the phone. I feel like Instagram such sometimes affect my productivity negatively. I'll agree with that. I'm not a good person to ask social media advice from. I have a YouTube channel and that's about it. Like I have Instagram and if you guys want to follow me, you can, but I only have like four or 500 followers on Instagram. I don't do a good job of it, honestly. Um, so it's not something I should be giving advice for from what other people have said, post regularly, uh, and always maintain your brand at the forefront of your mind. Hmm. I'll send some pics and vids when I get the walls painted. Dude, do it. I want to see your check out studio South turn, South turn. Okay. I will. How do you go about branding yourself? Oh, Wow, that came back quick. Uh, have you ever used Adobe Audition? No. Uh, how do you go about branding yourself? As a studio or as an artist? Give me a little bit more there. Uh, I can give my thoughts. Go to plugins, hardware for vocalists to hear themselves through. 
So my go-to stuff, my vocal chain rarely changes. Uh, once I found and settled on it, I kind of stuck there for a while. I normally go through, well, there's a manly uh, reference cardioid in the ISO booth that's back yonder. Uh, if you can see through this window, there's a live room, and then past that, there's a window that is the ISO booth. And inside there, there's basically always a manly reference cardioid set up for vocalists ready to go. I send that through uh, a Brent Avril 1084, which is basically like a Neve 1084. And if you don't know the difference, 1084, 1073, um, essentially the same thing. The EQ is a little different on the high band. It's a selective frequency high band, whereas the 1073, I think, is fixed at 16, 16 kilohertz, I think. Um, or the 1084 is selectable. Um, but I think it sounds cleaner than the 1073, not quite as aggressive, a little smoother, uh, at least the ones I have, because these are vintage units and they have been used and abused and sound awesome and squishy and dirty and I love it. Uh, so that will go through a distressor. Um, and the distressor, I will typically hit pretty darn hard. Uh, and that's actually what I, the exact thing I'm using right now for these vocals on this stream. Um, except I'm using SM7 into a 1084 into the distressor, and I'm not hitting it as hard as I would um, while I'm recording. But normally that is enough for that person to be really, really comfortable while they record. And I know when I go back to mix it, I'm going to compress the snot out of it anyway. So being able to EQ it a little bit, take some of the low end out of that vocal, then push it through a distressor and really squish it. And sometimes I'm hitting like minus 12, minus 14. Like I'm I'm really hitting it hard. Uh, but even after that, one of the mix consults I had um, recently, they were having trouble with the vocal. And I talked about one of the things I had done um and how I go about like my compression of a vocal. Cause that was their one thing. It wasn't sticking out very much. Um, and they were really surprised at how much I compress the vocal. And I feel like you really have to, especially in a dense mix, like what this person had, it was, it was a pretty dense rock pop mix. Um, so I sent the line signal back through 1084 into my distressor crushed it at like minus 12 about where I would if I were tracking it. And then I pulled up my metric halo channel strip. I compressed it a little bit more. And then I pulled up our Vox and I compressed it a little bit more. And then, like, and then I think I ran it through uh, my TSL four uh, inward connections compressor, which is another outboard tube compressor. And I compressed it a lot more. And then lastly, there's a limiter that's really just taking the peaks off of it. Um, just barely, but still, I mean, that's a whole lot of compression over and over and over again. Um, at this point, I've completely forgotten what the question was, and I'm just talking about compression. Where? <laughs> oh, uh, getting singers to hear themselves. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I, I went a little off board on that one. Sorry. Uh... love hearing recording and mixing live drums, but there's a lot of pop singers and rappers in my area. Sometimes I wonder why I invested in a ton of IO. Yeah, that's, de <laughs> that's definitely something. If there's a whole, there, are, I know a couple of engineer buddies who are like around the Atlanta area and they've definitely gotten a lot of that type of stuff like pop clientele. A lot of stuff's already programmed and coming in. And he's moving studios and he's not really worried about having a huge IO because he knows that's his type of clientele. So take that into account. I know for me, I'm not very good at that stuff. Um, so I, I lean on bands a lot. And so I need the IO, but, uh, branding as a personality for a niche, mainly just interested in your personal story about how you branded yourself. <clears throat> I don't think I, I mean, I see you're, you're looking at the recording studio loser stuff. Um, I assume uh, branding from like my studio, I kept it as distanced from myself as possible. 
recording studio losers like the first thing that really has me out front honestly and i was even i was super leery to do that because i don't think i have much of a personality um and i with the studio side the stuff my my studio is called whisper studios like it's not even that great of a name but i kept it for a long long time i didn't talk about myself involved in it. I was trying to sell the building and sell the gear and sell the sounds that were made out of this building. Um, it wasn't until I really figured out that this, there's so much personal about this stuff. Like that's where you can really get the business is people want to trust someone. They don't want to trust a place is the building doesn't really, the building's a tool. The studio is a tool. It's who's running it. Who's at the helm. Do you like hanging out with that person? Do you get along with that person? So since then, I really tried to kind of expand on that. What is going on with my computer right now? Oh, good. Okay. We're still live. That's good. Since then, I've really tried to um, change that and put myself out front more, uh, enlisting myself as a producer, trying to put in much personality into the website and even in conversations that I have with clients because it is such a huge part of it and that can to tell you how the rest of the relationship's going to go um so yeah I think it's it's a big deal how have I done it <laughs> I've always poked fun at myself so especially the recording studio loser thing is just kind of my way of self-deprecating myself and i mean my personality type is a lot of that is very dry humor so i think i uh, there was so much out there already and i'm i'm an avid youtube watcher even before i was on the platform um i i mainly consume youtube for everything i just i love the platform i love learning as much as i can about so many things but I, with especially the recording studio stuff, like it was exhausting how many people were so, I don't know. I don't want to say, I don't want to offend anybody because I really, it's just not my style. Like I think there's validity to it for sure, but kind of that upbeat, super excited all the time. Um, I don't know, I think you guys know what I'm talking about with it. Like that type of personality just did not resonate with me. And I wanted to try something. I wanted to see because I love education. Um, my dream job is to like, I don't know if it'll ever happen, but I'd love to be a professor and teach sometime. Um, I just love the act, the act of teaching. And when I get to do like mixed coaching and mixed consulting, I absolutely love it. Um, so YouTube was my kind of way to do that. And I, how, when I was deciding how to present myself, I'm like, well, I'm a loser. I'm a recording studio loser. Like that would be the type of video I would watch. So I want to see, let's see if it works. See if anybody else can react to that. And that's as far as it went. Like that's about as much uh, thought as I put into it. So, <laughs> um, where are we at? Love your desk. Did you make it or what was it? I did make this desk. Um, yeah, it's made by me i knew i wanted i knew i wanted a couple bays here um there's one here that you guys can't see and then this bay it's basically identical on both sides and then there's a raven here in the middle and then i've got another screen up sitting on top i wonder if i can just pull this around and show you without knocking over my coffee oh boy Maybe a bad idea. Ugh. This thing's on a big old stand. Hello. Yeah, it's gonna be bad. Let's make a backup in there. Whoop. There's the desk. There's the side you guys never see with the compressors. Preamps are on this side, compressors on this side, there's the live stream, Raven in the middle, and then the live room. Ugh. 
That was crazy heavy and probably a bad idea. So yeah, I built this desk. I'm, I want to build another one because uh, I've had this for a couple of years and there's a couple of things I would do a little bit differently and I'm not sure I'm going to keep the Raven around. I don't use it as a touch screen. I've been through two of these things and the touch just stops working. I don't understand. I love the idea of the Raven. I want it to work so well, but it just hasn't been working for me. Slanted racks are sweet. Yeah. Uh, your vocal chain is similar to mine. I use a U87 Ventec X73. I love the X73s. I have, I have a couple of the 573s. I assume the X73s are awesome. Distressor to UA8 Pre. Please go into more detail about how you hit your distressor settings. I have mine basically set up like a like a an 1176. Um, I know the LA2A you can kind of go into opto mode, and I did that for a long time. I did use that opto mode a lot, and because it sounds awesome on just about everything, um, bass, smooth vocals, and it depends on what kind of vocal you're recording. Um, but how I've settled into like a very pop heavy rock or radio like country radio stuff like that i'm not used to talking this much guys how long have we been going my voice is starting to give on me an hour and 20 minutes holy cow wow okay um well 17 but still i don't talk this much typically so bear with me i'll be pounding some water here But I really found I I like recording, uh, like because I have a TSL four, which is kind of like an LA two A, like it's that squishy tube awesomeness. So if I don't want the distressor, I typically go for that. Um, so my distressor is pretty much always set up like an eleven seventy six. Like I have it on four to one. On that detector, I love that mid bump on the detector. Um. It just seems to grab those S's and stuff. And you guys are hearing it right now on this set. This is the setting I always have it on. Like if I bypass this, I can probably show you what it sounds like. I don't know. The gain might go crazy, but um, I typically have it on four to one high pass mid bump on the detector with a high pass on the audio. So I'm killing the low end twice on the my on the pre and on the distressor. And then that's just going into the burls back here right now. It's not, it's going into my live stream, but I wonder how loud this will be if I hit bypass. Check, 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 check. Without compression. With compression. I'm definitely pulling back on it a little bit. So, and this is just talking, so you're not going to hear a crazy amount, but. Uh, studio looks awesome. How did you find a space to turn it into a studio or the previous treated room you moved into? I found it hard trying to come up with a studio. Uh... This place, this building, was a doctor's office before. Uh, this is a freestanding building, about 3,000 square feet. It was an optometrist before I got it. Actually, uh, I know it was a pain care center. I think it was optometry a long time ago, and then it was a pain care center where they do, like, minor surgeries. Um, I don't know exactly what kind, but when I got it, like, the surgery rooms were still intact, and the main... Like where I'm sitting now was the main surgery room. Um, we ripped everything out of here. The only thing that's the same is the lobby, like way in the front, where if you see me sitting at a table um, and you can see my piano in the background in some of my videos, that's me sitting in the lobby of this building. Um, and that's the same. But other than that, we knocked down all the buildings and just went with a clean slate and um, put up double walls between the control room and the live room. Um, I have a lounge on the other side, all that fun stuff. Do you work on any hip hop tracks? Oh yeah. It's hard to, I think it would be hard to find a studio that doesn't. Um, especially like I haven't done it for a lot, for a while. Um, cause there's a couple other guys around here who have, who have opened up studios and for a while I was like the only game in town and I'm not anymore, which I'm totally fine with. But yeah, dude, there's some guys that I made a relationship with in the hip hop game who were just awesome. Like it, I will say it's not a, a musical genre that I listen to for enjoyment very often. Um, there's a few things I listen to, but 
man, when you get somebody who's like legit talented, it doesn't matter what genre it is. Like it, it could be anything and it's just, it's fun experience to work on. Wow. I think I'm all caught up on these questions. We're going on about an hour and 20. I will say, if you have any last second questions, go ahead and get them in. I'll probably wrap this up. If there's another question, I'll answer it. But I like doing, man, this is, this is a lot of fun. I will definitely be doing these more often if you guys want. Um, I like having something up I can do, but you guys asking questions, man, I don't, I almost don't even need to have Pro Tools up because you guys asked so many questions. Um, and if you, if you like it, help me with this video, if you would, um, put a comment on, uh, down, like in the actual comments of the actual video, what you like about this or what you don't like about it. And legit, if you like it, hit the like button. If you don't like these things, hit the dislike and tell me what we can do different. I know these are long. The lives are always super long. I feel like this is the venue to do that with. I've had a few people comment like, dude, they're too long. Like, I don't know. I don't know how to make them any shorter. Because we're just chatting and what happens, happens. But yeah, if you guys have any ideas, let me know. Uh, do you have any tips for mixing music live through a DAW for streaming and broadcast mixes? Love your videos. Are you talking about like what I'm doing right now? Where I have Pro Tools set up, ready to go? Or are you talking about like mixing it live with a client at home? Because those are two different things. Answer me real quick. Real quick. If you're talking about doing it like YouTube like this, um, I have a little separate mixer, like a Tascam DR60, I think, where I have a spot coming out from Pro Tools and that is going into my computer, which is feeding OBS. That's meeting up with the camera, going through OBS. This is going through a couple preamps, back into the computer, OBS, and then I'm out. Um, I am splitting, if you can see, I've got a master fader and a listen. Uh, master is what I can hear, and listen is what you can hear. So I have, uh, only difference is I have a limiter seeing how loud the feed is gonna hit you guys and then sonar works that I can hear. But I'm taking the feed for you guys off of this listen track where it just has a linear phase EQ doing nothing other than cutting the low end. And then that's hitting a hardware insert, which is my Neve master bus processor and JST clip and doing nothing but making sure it doesn't clip. Because I appreciate your guys' ears and I don't want to blast your ears. Whoa, a lot of last second questions. Uh, thank you for answering before. When and why did your confidence in your monitoring get real? I mean, when did you say, okay, I'm fine? Interesting question. I don't think, I actually think that happened pretty recently. <laughs> like I've been here for a while and I have you always go through that process of is it, are my mixes good? Am I doing okay? Is this approach the right way to go about this? Um, I will say once I got sonar, sonar works, it was a game changer. Um, and you hate to admit that even as like a studio owner, because I mean, some people will hate on sonar works, like just get your room right. Yeah. Yeah. There's a certain part, certain part of that, but there's certain things like, unless you pay, tens of thousands of dollars and trust me I've had it specked out and for a studio my size it just does not make sense to spend that kind of money so I know I can do certain things to the room but I need feedback on what I need to do so sonar works is a huge help and being able to take measurements of my room make small adjustments have sonar works pick up the slack um, has been huge and that's instantly like there's it was night and day um, and making my mixes better and I'm not even, I'm not sponsored by Sonarworks. I don't even have a link to give you. But if yeah, if there's one thing you can get, that was a big one. Uh, like with a client. Wait, like with a client or a, oh, you're asking for the streaming. Um, streaming for a client. There is a plugin. Listen to. I think is the plugin. Let me double check on that. 
yeah, audio movers. Uh, that's what I use. They have a plugin called Listen To. Pull it up, and I'll just bring it on down. You, there you go. Oh, let me get on my screen. Here you go. Listen to. Uh, this thing is fantastic, especially when when all this was going on and literally nobody could come to the studio. But I still had mixes to do. Um, this has honestly been a lot of fun to use, even in like turning mixes around really fast. Listen to like you can see it in the picture here. Um, you can pull it up on your master or wherever you want and basically broadcast that mix over the internet to someone else so they can listen to it in their own environment where they're comfortable. Because even sometimes having like an attended mix session here at the studio, people aren't familiar with my listening environment like I am. So they may give, have ideas that they just don't like. So especially working with other producers and other mastering engineers, I love to use this because they can listen in, in the environment that they're super familiar with. And you can get, as long as your internet connection is really good and you have a good speed, like you can broadcast a very, very high quality file. Uh, obviously it's not perfect. It's not like they're sitting with Pro Tools on their computer doing it, but it's darn close. Um, and especially for like real time mixing with somebody, like you can have somebody on the phone uh, while you're mixing and they're hearing it essentially exactly the same time. It's been really, really cool. So Audio movers, listen to, check it out. Let's back up here. Anything else? How do you manage your time between your studio, client work, YouTube, family? Ha. Huh. So I work YouTube in whenever I can. Like I will, if I have a couple hours, I can typically film a few videos. And that's why a lot of a lot of the things you see, I was laughing because my last few thumbnails have been me in the exact same outfit because I recorded all those videos on the same day. And then I went back and did the next set of videos in the next like couple weeks and I was wearing the same outfit again. So I'm like there's a stretch of like 10 videos where I'm wearing the same thing with a couple interspersed in between. So that's always funny. Yeah, I only have a few set of outfits that I, I'm always a black t-shirt kind of guy, but I went and just got a couple different colors. So maybe you'll see those, but yeah, I mean, if I'm not working in the studio, I'm trying to do something. Um, either if my wife is at home, I'm going to stay at home with her. I try to get as much time there. If my kid, kids aren't at school or the babysitter, I try to be home playing with them. Um, but if there's nothing in the studio, I'm making a video or I'm doing a live. And that's why sometimes I go dark for a little while because the studio is busy. Um, but it's, it is, uh, it's rare that I can't find at least an hour or two a week, even if it means waking up a little earlier and getting to the studio a little earlier to do a couple videos and then editing at home when the kids go to bed. So um, it's not that I'm squeezing time in. I'm just kind of stealing time from my sleep, I suppose. <laughs> so, yeah. Hey, love your passion, joy, humor. Thanks, man. Thanks, guys. I think I'm going to end it here. This has been a long one. Man, hour and a half. I cannot believe 29 of you are here for an hour and a half. <laughs> that blows my mind. I mean, the channel has come such a long way in a year, and it was just something to do for fun. Um, so I really like doing these lives it's completely different than making these videos in a vacuum and there i honestly have a blast with it uh for for a career where we spend most of our time alone working on a computer this is a very welcome change and if you know me if you know me at any level watching the amount of my videos you know i don't think there should be any secrets so i'm happy to always ask questions so Hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. Hit the notification bell because if I go live again, you're going to want to have your questions ready. So anyway, guys, see ya. I'm going to figure out how to turn this off so there's not a long, awkward silence. I'll see you guys later.